Amen. We've come to exalt the Lord today. Amen. Amen. I invite you to open your Bibles this morning to the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew chapter 13. Have you ever asked the question, what is heaven like? Or has anybody ever asked you the question, what is heaven like? In our church family here at Waldo over the past week or 10 days, we have talked about what heaven is like as this afternoon we will have our third funeral service in this past week. Thankfully, all three of them believers, all of them knowing Christ as their Lord and Savior and spending that time in eternity in heaven today. And so we've talked a lot about what heaven is like and the promise that you can go there. And this morning I want to address that question from a little different perspective. Matthew chapter 13, we're going to be looking at verses 44 through 46 this morning, and when you find that passage in your copy of God's Word, are able to look on with somebody or follow it uh, on the screen this morning, uh, I would invite you, out of reverence to God's Word, if you would, to bow your head with me this morning. I would also invite you to bow your heart before God. And take the next few moments of quiet meditation. And invite God to speak to your heart this morning. Take a few moments in quiet prayer. Then I'll lead us in a word of prayer and read our text. Father, we are grateful for the opportunity to worship you today. And more than anything else, I want to exalt you. I want to praise you. I want to worship you. I want my worship to be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. And I know that as we have sung praises, as we have fellowshiped, given, spent time in prayer already, that the real test of worship comes when we spend that time listening to your word and then being obedient. And so I pray that as you speak to our hearts today, that we will have those spiritual ears with which to listen. Bless the time that we have in your precious word. Amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 44, the Bible says, And once again Jesus spoke to them and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which when a man finds it, he hides it. And for joy he goes, sells all that he has, and buys the field. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant man seeking fine pearls, who when he has found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had, and he bought it. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his precious word. We know that Jesus' most familiar and popular way of teaching was through parables, an earthly story that helps illustrate a biblical or spiritual principle. They are similar to fables, only they're somewhat reversed. In a fable, you tell the story, and then at the end of it, you give the moral of the story. In a parable, you generally share the principle first, and then the story to help you understand that spiritual principle. We always have to remember, though, when we look at God's Word and we are interpreting God's Word, that when we look at parables, we need to remember that a parable is designed to teach, reinforce, or illustrate a spiritual principle. Almost always, it's one primary 
principle. We don't build creeds and doctrines out of parables. I was reading somewhere this past week about someone who said if we used all the words of Jesus and we built all of our doctrines simply on the words of Jesus and we built doctrines and creeds on the parables, imagine what we would look like today in the modern day church. And he goes on to say this, we all grew up singing the song, the wise man built his house upon, you know, the rock and the foolish man on the sand. The wise and the foolish builder. If we built all of our doctrines or creeds on that parable, we would have to say today that it is completely unbiblical to build a house on the beach. Because you'd be building it on the sand, that'd be foolish. And so we'd say there's a biblical principle that says you can't build a house on a beach. See how foolish it could be if we built creeds and doctrines on parables? Jesus taught us about foot washing. One of the most beautiful and intimate times of worship there can be, if you've been involved in that. I have been involved in several experiences of worship and humble and servantness in that. But I have never done it quite the way they did it on occasion in the New Testament where you washed someone's feet with your hair. We don't build doctrines and creeds on parables. How about the parable of the cost of discipleship? Last Sunday afternoon, we had a funeral service. This past Wednesday morning, we had a funeral service. We have another one this afternoon. You realize that if we built our doctrine and creeds on parables, in the modern church today, we'd not be able to have a funeral service because one of Jesus' parables on the cost of discipleship was what? Let me first go home and bury my father. And Jesus said, no, if you're going to follow me, follow me. He was given a spiritual principle, not about not going to a funeral, but about following him as the greatest priority in our lives. So we have to be careful that we don't base our doctrines and creeds on parables. By the way, how many here like figs? Uh, unbiblical. In a parable about the fig tree, Jesus did what? He cursed the fig tree. So all of you modern day believers who are eating figs, you are unbiblical. You don't know it, but at some point Jesus cursed greens. It's in my book of James. <laughs> then he cursed okra <laughs> and tomatoes. Yeah, again, you, you, you understand. We, we don't base all of our doctrines and creeds on parable. We look at a parable and we say, what is the point or principle that Jesus is trying to get across? And then he shares a story to help us understand that. In Matthew chapter 13, it's different than any other chapter in the New Testament. He shares one primary spiritual truth about what the kingdom of heaven is like. And he shares not one, not the two we looked at today, the hidden treasure and the pearl of great price. In chapter 13, you can go home and dig it out this week on your own time. Eight parables in one chapter on one spiritual principle. There is no other topic in the New Testament that Jesus shared as many parables about. There is no other subject in the New Testament that Jesus took time to share. What is the kingdom of heaven like? It's like this, or it's like this, it's like this, it's like the eight just in this chapter. Now I want you to go back and read one more verse if you would. Chapter 13 and verse 11. Because this sets the stage for understanding the kingdom of heaven. Chapter 13, verse 11. Jesus answered and said unto them, after they asked, why are you telling us parables? Jesus answered and said unto them, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of what? The kingdom of heaven. Now stop right there, keep that verse up there if you would. To understand the mysteries of heaven, what's the mystery? 
something hasn't been revealed yet, you don't know all about. And Jesus said, there's a mystery. We don't know everything about the kingdom of heaven. I'm going to tell you about the kingdom of heaven, and I'm going to use some stories to help you illustrate what it's like. Now, notice the last part of it. But to them, it is not given. Now, go back to our text in verse 44. Jesus says, there are some who will understand the principle of the kingdom of heaven, and there are others who will not understand the principle of the kingdom of heaven. Don't miss that basic spiritual truth. Not everybody understands what the kingdom of heaven is all about. So I want to share two questions with you today. I hope you'll jot them down. I hope you'll spend some time studying them on your own this week. First question I want us to ask is, what is the kingdom of heaven? And then second, what value do you place on the kingdom of heaven? What is the kingdom of heaven? I share, Jesus is going to share eight parables in this chapter about the kingdom of heaven. We're just going to look at the two shortest ones today. Okay, let me share that again. We're just going to share the two shortest. Yeah, that's what I, I knew. So you, I want to see if you're paying attention. I'm not going to share all eight. Well, you're not supposed to say amen to that one. You're supposed to say, preacher, it's so awesome and you're so great. We want to do all of them today. We're just going to share two of the short ones today. Of a hidden treasure and a pearl of great price. Two short stories to understand one spiritual principle. First in verse 44, only one verse about it. About a hidden treasure. Aren't hidden treasures awesome? Don't you wish you could find one? Ooh. About 2,000 years ago, what is probably, at least in my estimation, the greatest hidden treasure ever found. Maybe not necessarily in terms of what the earth would call valuable or what mankind would call valuable, but a shepherd boy in the Middle East would discover some clay pots inside some caves up on a cliff. Legend says, throwing rocks into the hole. Heard something break. Realized there was something in that cave. Upon discovery, over the course of the next 14 years, they would discover hundreds and hundreds of original documents that you and I know as the Dead Sea Scrolls. The biggest, largest, oldest manuscripts we had of the Word of God. Wow, that's a discovery. I've had the opportunity to do a lot of scuba diving, a lot of diving in the Keys. I love diving in the Florida Keys. There's not much treasure that you can find too much anymore. But there are little spiny lobsters that hide under things. Them are good treasures. But every time I'm diving, I always have this little thing that I'm going to be the one person who's going to be Diving along there looking for lobsters, I'm going to see something shiny in the sand. I'm going to reach down, dig it out, and it's going to be an old gold bullion coin from the 1600s. And I'm going to come back up, and you know what I'm going to do? I'm not telling anybody. I'm going to mark the spot, and then I'm going to go back and do what? Dig as many of them up as I possibly can. I just always had that dream when I was scuba diving that I'd find some treasure. A man in Suffolk, England, plowing in his field, who comes across not just artifacts, but massive treasure, just plowing in his field. Whoa! Here's one for a few of you. 
And if you get this, just kind of raise your hand. If you don't, just leave your hand down. I'd like to know what's under Oak Island. Yeah, come on, raise your hand. I don't be the only one to... See, there's other few people know what I'm talking about. What treasure? Hidden treasure. I love it. Their culture, in their Jewish culture, in the Old Testament, even in Jesus' time, they buried their valuables. In the Old Testament culture, all of those ancient civilizations, the Jewish people didn't walk into town and put their things in a safe deposit box inside a bank vault. They buried their treasures. It's not unusual to find hidden treasure throughout all that part of the world. It's amazing. When you look at it, you think, wow, he discovered something. Almost seems dishonest to me. He finds it in a field that he doesn't own. Then he goes and buys the field. And you and I might think, shouldn't he tell the owner? <clears throat> In their culture, they bury things. In fact, Jewish law said, if you find scattered fruit or scattered treasure, it belongs to you. That was part of their law. What do we call that? Finders keepers. How many ever said finders keepers? What else did you say? Losers weepers. Yeah, we all understand what that is. I found it, so it's... Fine. But he finds this hidden treasure. He believes it is so valuable that he sells everything he has and he buys the field so that the treasure is his. He sells everything that he has so that he can buy the field to get the treasure. Then in verse 45, a pearl called the pearl of great price sometimes translated as the perfect pearl. If you know anything about pearls and the Bible, you might know that in the Old Testament, there are very, very, very few references to pearls in the Old Testament. In fact, there's only one. A very obscure passage to a pearl in the book of Job. But by Jesus' time in the New Testament, in the Roman Empire, pearls were very, very valuable. The very wealthy and elite and rich, the women would weave the pearls in their hair to show how wealthy they were. Some of the emperors, some of the Caesars in Rome, would actually have pearls ground down into dust and then have it put in their wine and they would drink it. Not to make the wine taste better or different, but it was that symbol of I've got so much money, I just grind pearls up, put them in my wine, and drink it. Kind of like the old adage, some of you are old enough to know, it's kind of like the old adage of lighting your cigar with a $100 bill. i got so much money. That's the principle. By Jesus' time, pearls are absolutely valuable. By the way, the man was called a merchant. In the Greek, the word emporos, that we get our word emporium from. He's a merchant, and he finds this pearl. It is the perfect pearl. And then what does he do? He, like the man who finds the hidden treasure, sells everything he has to buy that pearl. A pearl. In the New Testament... We learn about pearls. We have this story about the pearl of a great price. Pearls are unique. It's, it's to me, quite unique that Jesus uses pearl in the parable. Not diamond, not ruby, not opal, not sapphire, not emerald, some of those other things. Pearl. The pearl being that one symbol that is used later of heaven. Uh, what are those gates made out of? Pearl? Now, I don't know about you, but pearls are okay. I think rubies are prettier. And if you want to give me a, a pocket full of jewels, pearls are nice. But I'd rather have a pocket full of what? 
diamonds, mm -hmm. but pearls. Uniquely, when it talks about heaven and gates of pearl, using that illustration of when you think of just how beautiful heaven is, it's that idea of the pearl. Uniquely, the pearl is one of the precious stones, one of the precious things that man does very little to improve. You cut a diamond. You cut and polish rubies, emeralds, sapphires, but a pearl? I, I love that, that God says, hey, you know what? You can't improve on heaven. And you want to know what it's like? It's like the hidden treasure. It's like the pearl without a price. Second question I want us to see is what value do you place on the kingdom of heaven? You must know that both of the individuals sold everything they had to obtain the hidden treasure and the pearl. That's how valuable it was to them. They were willing to sell everything to get the hidden treasure and the pearl. And if the kingdom of heaven is like that, is that the value that you and I place on it? Do we think of the kingdom of heaven as being so valuable that we are willing to give up everything else? That nothing is as valuable to us as the kingdom of heaven. And I want you to know that the gospel as shared in the gospel as shared by the Apostle Paul and the other writers of the New Testament. The gospel is not simply a fire escape from hell. We have, in some of our modern times today, made the gospel into something it is not. It is not simply a fire escape from hell. It is something that we view as so valuable, we're willing to give our lives for it. I am not just saying, God, keep me out of hell. That's not the gospel. I am saying, God, save me from hell, and I give you my life. That the kingdom of heaven is more important than anything else. Is that the gospel that you hold on to? If you're not sure what God's going to say to you when you stand before him, if you don't know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're going to spend eternity in heaven, one of the greatest truths of the Bible is that you can know that. If you're willing to come God's way, every week we share it. If you're willing to tell God you're a sinner, I've sinned, you've sinned. And we're willing to confess that sin. We're willing to tell God, I'm sorry. God, forgive me. I'm sorry for my sin. Forgive me. And we're willing to put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ who's sharing the principles about heaven and give him our life. God says he will forgive our sin, adopt us as his child. And that kingdom of heaven, that home in heaven, is ours for eternity. But we've got to come his way. God, I'm sorry for my sin. Forgive me. And I put my faith and trust in your son, Jesus Christ, as the way to heaven. Not going to church, not doing good things, but in him. And the Bible says, if you'll do that, your choice, your life, God will forgive your sin, adopt you as his child. You've got to ask him for forgiveness. And give him your heart and trust Christ. This morning in a few minutes we'll close our service and we'll invite folks to come and pray here at the front. If you're not sure about your relationship with God, if you don't know what it is, if you don't know what God's going to say to you but you'd like to know more, or you'd like to settle that today, We'd like to take a few minutes of your time before you go today. Sit down with you with God's word and say, here's what the Bible says. Here's how you can know. 
I'll be standing here at the front in just a few minutes. And when we invite folks to come during our invitation, just come and say, Pastor, I, I don't know, but I'd like to. Or I've got a few more questions. And we'll take a few minutes of your time before you go today and share that with you. A hidden treasure and a pearl of great price. One finds it in a field, the other one finds it in the ocean. I love that, such a broad area. <laughs> it's a pretty neat illustration there. And the first one who finds a hidden treasure, what does he do? He goes and sells everything he has, buys the field to have the treasure. The second one finds a pearl, sells everything he has to buy the pearl. But there's something you need to know about both of them. While they sold everything they had, neither one of them sacrificed. They purchased. There's a big difference. You might be thinking, wait a minute, they sold everything they had. That's a sacrifice. But they sold everything they had for what? Something they valued more. So if I said to you, anybody here got a $20 bill? How come no one's raising their hand? And I said, all my wife gave me to spend this whole week is a $10 bill. And I said, it's all I got. Will you trade me your 20 for my 10? I know what most of you would say. <laughs> no. There's a few of you just kind-hearted, sweet souls who would do it. But you'd understand, if $10 was all I had, and I gave it to you for $20, have I sacrificed? Not in the least bit. If I gave you $10 for $10 worth of merchandise, I've not sacrificed. I've simply purchased. Neither of them sacrificed. They purchased. The Bible says that Jesus purchased our redemption. And from that standpoint, he paid the price. But I have to tell you, it was a sacrifice. Jesus gave his life. God gave his only son for you, for me. The very fact that if I give him my life while I'm alive on whatever years God gives me on this planet, in exchange for what he's going to give me for eternity, is not a sacrifice. And it puts it all in perspective for me. That if I give God everything, my time, my talents, my finances, if I give God all of it, my family, my pastorate, I've not sacrificed. Not compared to what God has given me forgiveness, and eternity in heaven. Can you with me this morning try to get a grasp of that? That God has sacrificed. And if we really believe that, if we really believe that God sacrificed, 
that Jesus sacrificed his life. And God sacrificed his son. then you and I have to look at it and go, if I give him everything, I haven't begun to pay him back. If I give him my time, my talents, my treasures, my finance, I haven't begun to pay him back. So if you're a child of God today, I'm going to ask you this morning to say, God, I've really not recognized how valuable heaven is. I really haven't grasped what the kingdom of heaven is. Oh, I'm looking forward to being there. I'm looking forward to spending eternity in heaven with those who've gone before, with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But I really haven't grasped what it's really worth. Because if I do, I'm willing to give God everything. And if you're a child of God today, that's the commitment I would ask from you this morning. That in a moment when we have an invitation, not to me, between you and God, to come and just say, God, I, I owe you everything. And this morning, I'm giving it to you for whatever you want to do with it. Because what you gave me is infinitely greater. So I'm willing to give you my time, my talents, my treasure. If you're not sure if you're a child of God, if you don't know that you're going to spend eternity in heaven, I invite you to come this morning. Give us an opportunity to talk to you about it before you go today and share from God's word how you can know that. You're willing to give him your life today? Whether it's giving him your life in salvation, or I wonder if you join me this morning at the front saying, God, I'm, I owe you. And I can't possibly give you what you've given me, but I'm giving you everything I have. Everything. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me this morning? Heads bowed. Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're going to spend eternity in heaven? If you don't, you can. And I'd invite you to come this morning to know that. I'll be standing right here at the front. To my brother, sister in Christ, I invite you this morning to come with me here at the front and say, God, I owe you everything. And I'm giving you my life today to do whatever you want to with it. Maybe you want to come and pray for somebody. I'm grateful for our church family. We have so many families that are dealing with struggles and individuals dealing with heartache and struggles. Even just the death angel visiting three of our families this week. Maybe you'd like to just come and pray for somebody this morning. You know our altar is open for that. Father, I pray that you'd bless our invitation time now. May we be willing to be obedient. In Jesus' name we pray. I'd invite you to stand with your heads bowed this morning. As our instrumentalist begins to play, I invite you to come this morning. As a child of God, to come and say, God, I, I owe you. And I'm giving you my life. I'm giving it to you fresh and anew this morning for you to do what you want. If you're not sure about your relationship with God, come. Come on.